Hello and welcome to Captain's Dry Dog. This is the second part of a two-part episode making the Star Trek Type 2 Phaser. Phaser's on stun, let's make it real. Presenting all the parts that make up my Type 2 Phaser. Now, since the end of Part 1, I printed them off and I started cleaning it up. Meaning that this was in two parts because, as I mentioned in Part 1, I've got a significantly small resin 3D printer, amongst many other things. <laughs> and so what I had to do is actually separate this as two parts and print these individually and then print them off and put them together. Otherwise, this ideally would have been printed as one piece, which would have saved a lot of time, hassle, and also making sure there's no step and keeping it nice and neat. So what I'm gonna do now is give you an overview of how all the parts come together. Starting with the main body, I need to show you the handle cover. Now, this will not be permanently attached to the phaser because this will require access to get to the battery if it needs changing. So I've got a location point for the magnet here and also there. They're made specifically for a certain size of magnet. Then I just get the slot, just pop that in the inside of the handle and then push. The muzzle. The muzzle has location points. I'm going to add a certain special type of glue, which I'll go into later, and that will just align automatically. No aligning by eye required because location points will do that all for me. The top cover. That, yep, it goes on top of the phaser. But one thing that's missing is the display. Now, the display currently in its form is actually in the grey resin I've done the rest of the phaser. But this will eventually be printed in the clear resin. This is just a prototype to make sure it fits, which it does. The control panel with the trigger and the two up and down settings. And they go in this little area here. However, they need to depress some micro switches, which means I need to make myself one of these. Now this is the location points for the micro switches as well as a little hole for the wires. Now that goes on the inside of the phaser here through the access hatch. No loop glue required because I was clever enough or should I say I actually saw some other examples online where people use this joint where I can snap this panel in situ and if I want to remove it later just get a screwdriver and push that out just in case. And the last part is the access panel which will be for the bottom. So this is where the uh, micro switch is to switch on your entire phaser but I wanted to hide that which will be behind this access panel. You're wondering why there's three or four red dots there. That is filler because those locations actually are hiding four magnets. And once that's painted, no one will know. And where's the other four magnets? The other four magnets are in the inside there. So once that panel is just popped there, those magnets will snap in place and no one will be none the wiser that this is an access panel to be able to remove and actually access the switch. Now, I also want to talk about prototypes because no matter how good things may look like on the screen, it may not translate well in the real world. Meaning that this hatch here wasn't really big enough for the speaker. I could barely fit it in there. So what I did, yep, I made that hole larger. So it's really good just to make things two or even three times just to get it right. Then if I flip this over, Yep, you can see I attacked it with a Dremel because I found the cables weren't fitting correctly. In fact, there wasn't a lot of room. So again, I made a different version and included a channel for those cables. So it's really important to make some prototypes or should I say tried and tested final versions. So I thought this was gonna be the final version and then I thought this was gonna be the final version. Why wasn't this the final version? Because 3D printing isn't the case of pressing a button and walking away, it's done. There's an art to it because yes, my phaser's got measles. Now if you compare to the later print, there, I don't have that effect because with 3D printing, it depends how you orientate it on the bed. Now, I had it this way, which meant it needed a lot more support. So when it came out, it had loads of supports and loads of dimples. Now, I could actually work with this, but it meant that I would have to do a lot of filling and it would have been an absolute ball lake to get it right and it would not look perfect. All I needed to do was actually tilt it this way and there we go, as smooth as data's bottom. While we're on the subject of prototypes, this is the access hatch I was mentioning before. Now, what's the difference? Well, you can see the magnets on this one. Now, 
I could quite happily use this. No one's none the wiser because once that goes on the phaser here, no one's going to see it. But I like to make things as 23rd century as possible, even to the point that when you remove this access hatch, that you don't see how it's attached. Now, what I did here was actually do the same print, but I made holes on the outside. So those magnets go all the way in. There's a one millimeter uh, uh, gap of resin between the surface and the actual magnet itself. And I filled the back. So you cannot see the magnet, especially once this is all painted, you won't see this at all. Whereas this looks a little bit ugly. So that's one of the reasons why I actually upgraded this panel. So right now I'm starting off with the Nano, soldering all the components together. Now I have a love-hate relationship with electronics. I love what they bring to props, they make them come to life. Hell, I really enjoy soldering it all together because who does not like the smell of solder in the morning, even though it's evening right now. But the hate bit is the fact that out of all the spaghetti junction right here, all it takes is a dodgy connection or wire not touching a point and the entire thing's gonna fail and not work, which means it's an absolute ball lake having to try and navigate all this and find out where things have gone wrong. In fact, it's really easy to actually miswire those points as well, especially if you only got about six or seven different wire colors. Now I know in part one, I've already done this temporarily on a breadboard, but that's different because those connections were also already provided as slots and holes. So I knew those connections were gonna work, so there's no stress. But this is all down to you with a solder and a soldering iron. So in short, my advice to you if you're getting into electronics is to check, double check, triple check and invest in one of these, a multimeter. Because there's only six different colours of wire that I have, I need a way to identify what wire does what. And so what I've done, I've made these tiny little labels here. So this is a D5, so I know exactly what pin it attaches to on a Nano. So now, hopefully, this will be a lot more easier once I install this into the phaser and wire up these ends to the adjoining components. Now I'm at the stage of installing all those electronics and packing them in such a small model. Now I know there's many electronics experts out there screaming at the video saying, why did you not use a PCB board? You could design it yourself, it would have actually fitted into your model and have room to spare. True, however, I just don't have that skill set yet. I just have not got around to learning. I have installed the program Eagle, which allows me to be able to design my own PCB boards and also interfaces with my Fusion 360 model, meaning anything I design in regards to a circuit board, I can see if it fits in my actual model before having it built. And plus, I don't have the facilities to be able to make my own PCB boards. Now, I know there are plenty of websites out there, mainly based in China, where you can actually upload your PCB board design and actually get them to make it all for you and then send it over to you. However, this is just a one-off and usually you have to order at least 10 or 50. It costs a little bit more money, but this is just one, or perhaps I'm gonna make two because I might make another one, which might be a, an improvement on this one. So in the meantime, I have to stick to what I know, which is the Arduino. And you know what? It actually barely fits, but it fits and it works. This is the evolution of the electronics. So this may be familiar to you if you've seen part one of the episode of making the phaser. So this is the breadboard. This is the development, making sure everything actually works before soldering it all together. So there's a lot going on in here. Now, cut to this. This is basically everything all soldered together. So it's a lot more smaller. Obviously, there's no breadboard. The switches are smaller. Um, and so all the parts are generally there, which mimic what I did from the breadboard. Uh, but this, I used these special tiny little plugs. And this was meant to actually keep things neat and tidy when I went to install into the actual phaser. But one thing I found, and especially with my soldering skills, this is tiny and I didn't even have a magnifying glass to be able to solder little, little buggers together. Opened up many potential issues with cross wires and short circuits. So I thought to myself, I'd rather just go without these little plugs and just go straight from Arduino board to the component itself, which brings me on to here. Now, I've actually packed it all in here so you can't see what's going on, but essentially it's mimicking what you see up here on the second reincarnation of the actual electronics. And so everything's wired directly from the Arduino uh, Nano 
and it goes straight into the main body of the phaser itself and then straight into the component so there's no plugs whatsoever now people who do pcb boards as i mentioned i'd like to do that one day uh, they would actually separate all the components out with little plugs which means if there's something that goes wrong you can actually just detach them and also installing is so much damn easier but here luckily because i actually made this entire phaser from scratch i made sure that i had access hatches down bottom the side everywhere so i can access all these little switches and uh, wires so i can install this later on now we're on a home stretch and you guessed it painting now i have to highlight that in america where the props the original props were made for the film and tv show they used a brand called krylon which is not available outside the united states and that is an issue when it comes to accuracy now when you're in the united states and you're producing anything from star trek you can pretty much guarantee you're going to get the exact light colors because they still produce them today however outside the us we just have to make do with our best interpretations of the colors that we've seen online and on TV and yes I know I've got plenty of good reference pictures from auction houses however you can never ever rely on good reference from photographs why because it depends on the color it depends on the lighting when they were taken at the time and it's never going to be 100% so I basically have to make peace with it not going to be 100% accurate and that's not a big issue unless someone has the actual prop in their hand and compares it with mine no one's going to really know about that which brings me on to the trigger. Now, the one thing that does stand out in regards to the color differences, there's two different types of trigger color from the two photographs I got from auction houses from two different props of the Type 2 phaser. One actually is aluminum silver and the other is red. And because I've actually got two of my prototypes in here, I'm gonna have one in red and one in aluminum silver. And you may be asking, why am I painting both prototypes? Well, in fact, both of them are absolutely fine. It's, it's just that one of them's adjusted slightly to be better in regards to installing electronics. This means that I can experiment to find out, is it better to paint after installing electronics into a prop or model or before? So, so far, I found that having the electronics inside the prop before I painted is brilliant because I can make sure everything's working and I just have to paint it and that's it. However, the downfall is, is that I have to really make sure that everything's masked off correctly because any overspray going through a gap may destroy some of the electronics and that would be an absolute nightmare. The swings and roundabouts of not installing your electronics means I don't have to worry about that. However, when I finish that lovely paint job and I install the electronics afterwards, I have the worry of damaging that paint afterwards. So I'll find out after this experiment which I prefer and I'll let you know. Oh, before I forget, you're probably wondering if I'm not using Krylon, what am I using? I'm using Hycott. Hycott. So this is readily available on Amazon and I'm using just a couple of different colors because this prop is really simple. So every time you see black, that's gonna be satin black. And every time you use silver, that is Volkswagen Reflex Silver. Who would have thought the 21st century uses Volkswagen paint? The majority of the phaser has now been painted, which leaves me with, well, detailing the details. Now, looking at a few of the pictures I have of the different versions of Type 2 phases out there from the auction sites, taking a closer look, the setting buttons are an off-white colour, almost like an ivory, which means that I need to break out the dual action airbrush, raid my Games Workshop paints, and try and match that colour as much as I can do by eye. So I know it's not canon, but I want to add another lovely little detail to my phasers because it's going to be on a part of the phaser that you won't be able to see anyway. So really, this is just for myself. And what I'm going to do is add, yep, on and off labels, but I'm going to make it look cool because I want it to look like the whole Federation graphic design look, which they usually have like the rounded edges to the boxes, uh, very much like uh, tablets. And then I'll just make that red. And what I need is the correct font so there's actually a really cool font that i love to use called akuda yep it's named after the one of the guys who actually worked on star trek and this is the kind of uh, recognizable font you would have seen in star trek the next generation so i've already put that into my computer and all i need to do now is just type in let's just say armed so that's at Air, uh, mirrored pro but i'll just call it akuda there we go should we try let's just go for a standard 
and uh, there we have it. Yep, you can see it is very recognizable to Star Trek The Next Generation's font, and I'm going to make that white. However, this is actually going to be printed on uh, decal uh, transparent paper, so anytime you see white, that will be clear, so the silver will shine through. So I think armed for that. So the other label, what am I going to do? Armed, I think I'm not going to put off, I think I'll do safe. I think safe is really apt, it looks professional, and I reckon once I print that off and pop that onto my phaser, that will look awesome. So the question is, how am I gonna transfer that design onto my phaser? Answer, yes, water slide decal printing paper. All I need to do is print those designs onto this paper, give it some time to dry, then apply a couple of coats of clear lacquer because they're gonna have to go into a bath of water and then slide onto the phaser. Well, I'll give it a couple of more coats to protect it. Once I can feel it loosening off on the backing paper, I just carefully slide it into position. Now this is really, really delicate stuff. So I have to make sure to take my time, but not too long because sometimes the water, and then I just position it as central as I can by eye and that will be that. And then with a little bit of tissue, just get that to absorb the remnants of the moisture and water. As this is a prop that's gonna be handled a lot, I need to protect those decals with this stuff, Microset. It's a formula which is especially made for decals and making sure that they set properly and it makes it look as if they've been printed directly onto the surface of the prop which is a fantastic little touch. The great thing about making something from scratch is that I know how it all comes together and it all works perfectly. So there's a little bit of give in each of these buttons and there's a little hollow for, yep, yeah, you guessed it, locating the micro switches inside. So all I need to do is place some glue either side where the control panel is, flip it upside down and that will locate automatically. And if you listen, you can hear that, yep it's automatically located those micro switches. Now, what glue am I going to be using? Now, throughout the entire build, I've been using this stuff, B7000. Now, this is a type of glue that is used when gluing screens back onto iPhones if you smash them. And this is exactly the same type of stuff. It takes a while to set, but it's a really, really great glue to use if at a later stage you want to take things apart because it's very strong holding things together. But with a little bit of prying, you can actually eventually take this off, which I like to have the option to if anything goes wrong inside electronics. I've used this glue also for the muzzle as well, and that is solid. That is not going to come off, not even with a bang. So this stuff, I highly recommend it if you're dealing with electronics in your props or models and you still want the option to be able to access them if the worst should happen. Although it looks like it's all painted, I need to address this little part here. So going online, like I did just there, there's an instruction book for the Roddenberry's version of the phaser, which was made by the same guy who actually made the original props for the Star Trek TV show, Michael Moore. And as you can see by these instructions, there is some guidance in regards to the colors of the phaser, namely, this bit here. This part is meant to be painted blue or to be precise by the instructions, Tanya X13 metallic blue. Second to last thing I need to do to complete this are the magnets. There we go. So there's some two small little magnets there. And what that's for is for that little indent here in the handle cover. Because once that handle cover goes down, I want it to snap straight in place. And to do so, I just need to add just a tiny bit of super glue. There we go, just a tiny bit. And then add the magnet. Now this is made to measure this precise magnet. Now I just need to let that dry and then I'll put the other magnet into the handle itself. So that will just snap straight into place. Now that the magnets are glued into place, I just have to let go for the satisfying clip. Look at that. Automatically puts itself in the right position. Yes, that scary word.
copyright. And it's something I need to bring up with this particular build because after part one of this build, I had so many compliments from fans wanting to commission me to build them one, even wanting to buy the 3D files from me, which I would have loved to have done, even for free with the 3D files. However, CBS at the time of filming a few months ago, ago had a massive global crackdown and gave out cease and desist letters like sweeties to any maker that was potentially making something for public consumption, even if it was for free and it was unlicensed. So they had to stop and if they did produce anything for the public, they had to destroy it, which meant that these two particular phases are just gonna be for my personal cosplaying use for me and my partner. So it means I can't be commissioned to make anything from the Star Trek franchise for anyone out there. So let that be a public warning to anyone who's making something from that franchise, wanting to sell or give it away for free. So what did you think? This was such a fun project for me because it utilised everything I knew about making all in one prop. In fact, it utilised a lot of things that I learned over the last 13 months with 3D CAD software as well as 3D printing. And it came out better than I could have dreamed of. In fact, I could have kept on going with the prototypes because every time I made one, it just got better. But you had to draw a line in the sand somewhere, otherwise it'd be one of those projects that went on and on and on. Now, there's a few improvements that I would do on this. Looking closely compared to the photographs, I reckon the muzzle is a little bit smaller than what the actual prop was. And there's a few other little bits and pieces in regards to actually getting it together. I reckon I could have just tightened up just a little bit more, just make it to the quality that Tamiya make their model kits. However, this is never gonna go into production. This is just for personal use, as I mentioned before. But overall, I'm really happy with this. And now for the YouTuber fluff. Now, if you really enjoyed this project and you like to see projects like this again, not just about Star Trek, but also Star Wars and everything else on the sci-fi fantasy world, by all means, click on the subscribe button down below. If you have subscribed, Thank you so much, I really do mean it. Your support means the world to me. And by all means, leave a comment down below. I love to have a critique of what you just saw, if there's any improvements or any criticism about the actual prop itself. Cause I know there's a few things I could improve and perhaps one day I'll take your comments on board and I'll make myself another prototype, which will be even better. In the meantime, this is Captain's Dry Dock. My name's John Child. I'm gonna set my phaser to stun. Don't have to, because you are already stunning. Yeah, baby. <laughs> anyway, you stay safe and I'll see you on the next episode. Take care. <laughs>